and welcome to this Somerville Media Center Live edition for May 27th, 2020. I am joined once again by the chair of the Somerville School Committee, Carrie Normand. And today we have the director of early education for the Somerville Public Schools, Lisa Q. Welcome to you both. Let's start with Lisa first. Lisa, first time appearing. How are you doing? How's your family doing? Doing well. Um, uh, one of those folks who thought they had an empty nest and now has a 21 and 24 year old at home and couldn't be happier with having that. I know a lot of people aren't happy about it, but I am not in that camp. I'm thrilled to have my whole family around me. Uh, spoken like a true mom, like <laughs> a true mom. Carrie Norman, update on um, the western part of the city. The western part of the city. Oh, well, I have uh, my college student is home and taking an online class and, and working. I'm thrilled that he's working. Uh, my other one, I can hear Ms. Santos from the high school, who is one of the most extraordinary uh, history teachers and, and actually a parent of a Somerville graduating student. And uh, Evan's online in the other room, and I can hear Ms. Santos. And I have to say, it brings me great joy to be able to hear our educators um, and it's not just the content that they've been providing, it's that human touch and the human contact that I can tell you as a mom has meant everything to me. So I don't know, Joe, the, the change of the weather, I know some people were excited about summer. I just thought, oh my gosh, this is, there is no end in sight. It's a change of season and uh, we're in a holding pattern. Um, and I don't know, I, I don't see, I don't know, you know, everyone's asking, what's it going to look like in the summer? Are camps going to open? What's going to, what's school going to look like in the fall? And uh, to patiently well, say, you know, as soon as we have definitive answers, we will share them, but it's such an evolving story. Well, the change of season certainly indicates one thing when it comes to the seniors at Somerville High School, which is their graduation and commencement ceremonies. Um, last week, you updated us on um, the sy school system's decision to do a very low touch or no touch graduation ceremony up at Dilboy. Um, any updates on that, Carrie, in terms of the feedback you're getting from students, or parents, uh, or educators? I can tell you, uh, you know, Somerville, we're, we're a city of many opinions, and I love that about us. But I would say overwhelmingly, it has been well received. Uh, it'll be a no touch ceremony. I mean, people, students will come in and literally their diploma will be on the table. There is no handshaking, there's no, uh, but for those families, it's a, it's a chance to celebrate our students. For some of our students, this, is, uh, this might be their one graduation and we wanna celebrate the achievement of all of our students, but in particular, the ones that this is, this really is very significant, at least for now, this is the, the end of their formal education uh, for the foreseeable future. So that's exciting. Uh, Full Circle has also decided to do uh, uh, an in-person with a very, these are all extremely controlled, orchestrated, uh, distanced, uh, even the number of people in who will be near the stage is limited and we will be just apart. Uh, for those of you who've ever been to a full circle graduation, which is just one of my favorite celebrations, it is, it is full of joy. For them not to be able to hug each other, I think will be uh, an act of restraint that may be unparalleled. The eighth grades are doing, are trying to figure out how to, how to do move up ceremonies virtually. And when I last talked with a scale office, they had decided to stay with a virtual um, ceremony for a host of reasons. And I don't know if they've announced who their guest speaker is and I, and I will not steal their thunder. I will hopefully be able to announce that next week. It is, um, it, it is an exciting speaker. Right. You know, I'm, I'm glad that we're doing it instead of saying we'll do it next year because I don't think that's fair to the kids who are gonna be moving on to college and university. I mean, they need Service, some, yeah. some closure to their academic year. Thank you for the update. Lisa Q, wow, oh my God, Director of Early Education. Lisa, for those viewers who don't um, quite get the entire scope of what the Director of Early Education, if you wanna take a couple of minutes and then talk about what the future looks like. Mm. 
So um, I am in going into my seventh year as director of early oh education. Gosh. Can't believe that. Um, and prior to my coming to Somerville, um, we really didn't have anybody in the position um, as it exists today. Uh, and my position was developed because uh, out of some race to the top early learning challenge grants that the city received um, uh, to really do some deep analysis of the early education world in Somerville and decided that they really needed somebody to oversee programming within the district, but also to align practices and policies in Head Start and in center-based programs all over the city. So my job is really um, to do just that. And I do 50% of my work um, with child care centers, directors, teachers who work in those programs so that we can create one system. So Lisa, the magic word here, and I'm sure that we're gonna be spending a little bit of time talking about it is child care. Mm -hmm. And when people talk about childcare, we normally associate that with, uh, say, preschool childcare mm -hmm. or um, after school programs. There is a, a world that's opened up to me since the COVID uh, emergency about what childcare really is all about. Do you want to kind of take us through from the public school system? Mm -hmm. What are the earliest ages that you've got? to the latest, you know, the more older kids that still require childcare? Sure. So, um, you know, the childcare system has many, in, in any, any community, has many, many different entry points. Um, in Somerville, we are really, really lucky to have a strong family engagement arm in the Somerville Family Learning Collaborative. And in the Somerville Family Learning Collaborative, they're able to provide um, through a, a lot of the systems building work that we've been doing for the last few years, a program called Summer Baby, which um, provides prenatal and um, a home visit once the child is born. We have the Parent Child Plus program, um, which provides home visiting for families um, in their home languages if possible, especially Spanish and Portuguese. And then we also have a variety of play groups that SFLC runs from new parent play groups to various ages to even, um, I know there's a Nepali play group for families who, um, for whom that is their first language and their culture. And so there's multiple entry points for families with very, very young children with infants to um, join into what's happening in Somerville, in addition to the child care centers that provide infant care. Uh, then what, one, of the, um, one of the things we've been trying to work on is what sometimes happens for children is that um, once they hit age three, they tend, there tends to be a little bit of a cliff and there's not as much out there or as many entry points for three and four year olds. Um, our, our wonderful, wonderful SMILE program in the Somerville Public Schools, which starts at age four, you have to be four by August 31st, um, really only has seats for 232 children. And if you think about the fact that, you know, we have anywhere from 430 to 450 kindergartners coming in, where are the rest of those children going to go? And some of them um, are in our local child care centers or in Head Start, but then there are some children during their three and four year old years who are not in any kind of program. And then they arrive on, on our doorstep in kindergarten and um, may, may need some support. Um, although that's becoming less prevalent because of the work we've been doing, bringing the system together so that kids are arriving at kindergarten, um, ready to learn, ready to go. So starting them very, very early, you're seeing the results of that once they enter into the actual public school system in kindergarten. Exactly, yeah, we have a pretty robust um, tool that we actually developed homegrown um, based on other tools. It's called the Kindergarten Entry Skills Inventory or the KESI. Um, and we are seeing now after four or five years, some really nice gains in uh, things like how kids approach learning. So that's all of that sort of perseverance and being able to concentrate and focus. They have to be able to do that to learn anything. And we're seeing literacy and math gains as well. And Lisa, do the after school programs also fall under your guidance? They do not. So Somerville has, again, a very um, 
large after school program associated with the schools, community schools. I'm sure you've talked about it on the show and Carrie knows a lot about it. Um, and they serve children in the Somerville Public Schools. But then um, again, because of the systems building work, I, I have a parallel person who I think is going into his second year, Jose Mendez, who um, shares and leads the out of school time network, which is um, bringing together in the same way that I'm bringing together the centers in Head Start, um, bringing together out of school time programming to do some alignment and some support work. We've been uh, very, very fortunate to have received a, a large uh, state grant called the Commonwealth Preschool Partnership Initiative Grant. And that grant enabled us to start the Somerville Partnership for Young Children. And that was really the organization in which our center-based programs can fit. And we're hoping to have something similar happen for out of school time um, once they um, have some funding towards that. I'll ask you a very sensitive question. You use the word hope to have that. Considering uh, what's happening with the state economy and the city's budgetary constraints, no mm -hmm. doubt, and the school committee's constraints moving forward, um, what are you looking at in terms of a relaunch of your programs for the 2020-2021 academic year? Mm -hmm. um, the system is very, very fragile right now, and I think you, you started out your comments by saying you've learned a lot more about it um, since the crisis hit. And, uh, you know, it's one of the blessings and curses of this of this crisis is that um, it has it pulled back the curtain on the fragility of early education and care across the country um, in ways that people just sort of took for granted that there would always be child care and that as long as people had money to pay for it, they, they would be able to get it. And now we know that that is not true. And so um, so things are, I would say, a bit dire right now. Um, I spoke with a child care center director this morning who, you know, she's just not sure she can even reopen. The governor said stay closed until June 29th. She doesn't know if she can open. She doesn't know how many people are going to come back. She estimates 50 to 70 percent of her families may not. And she doesn't know if she's going to even have money to pay a staff. So um, the situation is, is quite dire. Let, let me shift over to, whoops. Let me shift over to Carrie for a moment if I can. Carrie, in terms of this early education um, partnership that we have with mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. leases, does that fall under the Somerville School Committee budget or are these almost all basic, basically operated under grants that are given? Uh. It has been an evolving process. When Lisa said she came seven years ago, there was not, uh, she's being humble. She has created uh, a, 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 an alliance, uh, an interweaving of childcare uh, through the schools, through home care, through uh, daycare centers, and to really bring we know that our kids, and especially our young kids, have are get an, are in a number of different kinds of childcare settings from birth till before they can't come in for pre-K or even K. And what Lisa's leadership has done has um, brought some interconnectivity to it to also offer professional development to educators. So the idea is not that every Somerville, uh, every young Somervillian, should have the same experience but they should all have a high quality early education, early child care experience. And that's what Lisa's leadership has done. It started through the, I think pretty much only through the Somerville, the school committee, uh, the, the Somerville Public Schools budget, but the work that she has forged with, with so many wonderful partners in the community and th on the city side too, um, has been acknowledged and, and We've been awarded some very significant grants from the city, I mean, from the state, and also Lisa, the private grant. Tell oh, me again. Yeah, we also have funding through um, a, a new funder um, called the Commonwealth Children's Fund, and they support birth through school entry work. So they have been a significant supporter of Summer Baby, and then also a significant supporter of play groups and the tuition assistance um, work that we started under Somerville Partnership for Young Children. So we actually started 
uh, an affordability fund, if you will, to fund families, especially those families who make just above the income threshold um, for Head Start. So they don't, they make too much to be able to go to Head Start. And if we see a family, we try and, and help them to, to go into that program. But then there are families who make just a little too much to get any kind of subsidy and yet they still can't afford childcare. So we've actually been able to fund over 30 children in the last um, year and a half um, to have a spot in one of our childcare centers. So that funding comes both from the state grant and from this um, new funder. So Lisa, how stable, I mean, I, I, I don't wanna bring you down, but you know, the, pur <laughs> the purpose of these shows are to kind of inform the sure. public about what could happen. How stable is that Commonwealth Fund? Um, the Commonwealth Children's Fund as a private philanthropy um, organization is a little more stable than the state funding. So the state funding um, and the state funding is, is the one we, we are um, really doing some major advocacy for, work for because that has to pass in the governor's budget. That we need legislation for. So we have been actually doing a full court press on advocacy with scripts. Um, call your legislator and tell them that you want the CPPI uh, grant to be uh, refunded. It will be our third year of the grant and um, we won't know for quite a while until the governor's budget passes. We've been invited to reapply and so that is a good sign, but we never know from year to year. And this year the governor's budget will be passed later than ever. And so we'll be living in limbo with people's, um, people's jobs on the line, um, could be until late July or August. So we have to, we have to live in this unknown um, with knowing that some of our important infrastructure is just on the precipice of, of collapse in a lot of ways, if we're being realistic about it. Well, um, child care is front and center in terms of the whole debate on how do people go back to work and they don't have child care for their kids. Carrie, you wanna kind of <laughs> walk us through what the system, the school system is thinking in terms of the child care that's gonna, and when I say childcare, I'm not talking just about infants or nursery right. school. Right. I'm talking about there is this whole other thing of childcare after school, after school programs that are funded. Yeah. Some people say, well, they're not necessary because they're not part of the education of the child. I wholeheartedly disagree with that. I think after school programs are part of, they serve two purposes, right? Parents have to work until 5.30, 5 o'clock, 5.30. It gives that extra hour and a half, two hours maybe, for kids to socialize in a safe environment with adult supervision, rather than the horror stories that we used to hear about latchkey kids, right? Right. right. I mean, that's my, my generation, latchkey right. kids, right? That's my generation too. Yeah. So, so talk a little bit about how the school committee, uh, and I'll put the words right in your mouth, is going to fight for those after school programs. Uh, I know how much they, and my mom was a single mom, four daughters. There were no after school programming. My after school programming was I would go to the public library because uh, there were adults there, or I could go home to an empty house. Those are my choices. So it is not lost on me by any stretch. Uh, Lisa earlier referenced um, the out of school time task force uh, which chaired by jose mendez he i was on that call this morning the media center was there heather is a bundle of energy and inspiration and so and i said it there i'll say it again is uh our out of school what is out of school i mean this is this whole thing is pushing the definition of what school is it's i have been humbled and inspired by how people have reinvented how to deliver services, but equally important as to, you know, whether it's through parkour or through Kesher or through parts of crafts, media center, what we know is every time a child uh, and, and I'm, or a student, you know, from little to age has any contact outside of their world, uh, it matters. It, this is about human contact. This is about humanity. I mean, when I heard Jenny from Breakthrough and to hear her voice and the number of family students that they are staying in contact with, I can tell you um, 
you know, my kid's in a better mood after he's been pre-calc and it isn't because he's loving math. It's because he gets to see Miss Abair and he sees his peers and the, the isolation of this is extreme and, and children aren't able to articulate it in the same way. I, so I, it, 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 I, our community partners, we need to figure out, there were some wonderful ideas about how do we coordinate so parents can go to one location and see what's out there. And we have been doing more and more and more of that. There's the Somerville Hub. Uh, Lisa Q has done amazing work in coordinating access to information for early education and, and childcare. Um, you, you know, there, here's the thing, it, public schools in some ways it is the biggest daycare program. Right, it's where our kids go, and and none of this can happen. Parents can't go back to work fully, uh, even if their kids are able to make themselves lunch. Right, they're still they're supervising education. It is uh, I, I continually learn how deeply intertwined all of our lives are. So, getting the schools open in whatever format, getting as many of our community partners um, up and running. Some want to to do it in person, some, you know, how do you do it safely? How, what spaces are gonna be available in the city? How can we, we can't do everything outside. I think there is such a deep need for contact, uh, for interaction, even if it's virtual. I mean, I, I never thought I'd be love Zoom, but to see 40 people this morning trying to puzzle out how to provide services for students over the summer and out of school time, it, it's, it's a wonder to behold, and yet the realities of, especially some of the smaller, I'm sure it's true for the early childcare providers too, is is there's also a financial concern, right? Do they have, some of their budgets are so tight, how can they get through? Uh, and and it's, who, who are, one person suggested, can the city in some way poll, survey families, you know, if this was available, how many would come back? And so you can get some handle on it. We can, right. I think we're going to have to really rethink, you know, registration or enrollment or what that looks like. Uh, but then there's also concerns about the, just the cost of keeping kids safe and adults safe and sanitizing wipes and everything else. And what we know about young kids is that they are hardwired to like touch each other and hug each other and put everything in their mouths and, Teenagers like to come together in very different ways, but uh, we can have the best laid plans about how to socially distance. And there are, there's also that human variable that we're, so all of these things are being taken into account. And Joe, I'm, I'm rambling a little bit. What was your question again? You did a good job at not answering that question, <laughs> but what I wanna do, no, Terry, seriously. I, no, okay. I understand exactly where you're going with it, but I wanna give one more plug. Yeah. Uh, Lisa, see if I have this correct. For the state legislators that are out there and who watch this, and they're coming in tomorrow, so I'm going to plug it again. Good. Please refund the CPPI. Yes, the Commonwealth Preschool Partnership Initiative Grant. Got it. That's a mouthful. I'm going to say CPPI, and I'm going to see yeah. how many of the state legislators know what I'm talking about. And, um, and Joe, while well, you have their ear, Anytime that they can give us any idea about what the funding will be for local districts and cities so that we can create our, our budget. I know they're in a tough position, but uh, we need some guidance from the state about what is coming or not coming. Um, it's, it's, it's it, you know, try to do everything with a bit of humanity and yet we need to know, I mean, for the, for the schools. We have to let people know, I think we come up to June 15th, you know, what's. Well, I think, I, not. I think we all have, you know, whatever business we're in, whatever we're, we're trying to do in our daily lives. I think the first thing that always comes to mind is people with younger children. And I didn't realize one of the first guests that we had on the school committee superintendent's update was Dr. Curley, Jeff Curley. And he's got three little ones at home. I, I was, I didn't want to say anything about, you, you know, oh my God, <laughs> what are you doing? How are you coping with this? But it hit home again in my own uh, uh, family. I've got one of my nieces and her husband live up uh, just out in Freeport, Maine. Now she works at Bowdoin, right? But she's got two little ones at home. 
And she said, Uncle Joe, I'm running out of things to teach them. <laughs> you know? But there it is. You know, parents are struggling. They're worried about their kids' education. They're worried about their financial health. They're worried about their physical health. They're worried That's about true. their mental health and their kids' mental health. So Lisa, from a early education standpoint, you certainly have a yeoman's amount of work to do. Do you, do you foresee how the Media Center can help you in promoting public-private um, partnerships to continue on with your early education programs? Yeah, actually we worked um, with Heather a month ago to produce a small um, video um, called uh, Learning at Home, Learning and Playing at Home um, with our own Maura Mendoza who runs our multilingual services department here because we were hearing from parents, even though we were doing, our team did such an amazing job putting out remote learning content from the Somerville Public School teachers and our three amazing instructional coaches that anybody, Head Start, teachers, families all over the city could use. As you, as you mentioned, it's hard. It's hard to do that at home. It's hard for your niece. And so we put out a video that showed children from all over Somerville working and playing at home and helping at home and how to be a helper. And so um, we're going to have to rethink what early education looks like. It's not going to look the same. And we're going to have to really look for how we can support children's social emotional development in this time. That's going to be, that's going to be our task and we're working on it. Well, I've got two things I'm going to have to start doing um, is pumping the CPPI with anybody who will listen and to, you know, some of the, some of the larger businesses in Somerville that I'm familiar with start pumping these private public private uh, partnerships because child care is front and center when it comes to what's going to happen in the future, whether it's people going back to work or people going back to school. Uh, it is just a conundrum that people are going to have to work together to solve. You know, like I say, Carrie, 28 minutes goes fast. Oh, um, so fast. So fast. I want to thank both you and Lisa Q. Lisa is the Director of Early Education for the Somerville Public School Systems. And once again, thank you to Carrie Norman, the Chair of the Somerville School Committee. For the Somerville Media Center, I'm Joe Lynch. Please stay safe, stay informed, and we'll see you next time.